Okay, we're talking today about neutralization reactions, what happens when you mix an acid and a base. And uh, the, the general concept is captured by this little illustration, that uh, if you have an acid that has a low pH and a base that has a high pH, you mix them together and the pH is neutralized. They wind up somewhere near the middle. Um, when I took chemistry in college, uh, our professor did a demonstration that I am not going to do for you because I don't want to drink salt water. Um, but he took hydrochloric acid and he had very carefully determined the molarity of the hydrochloric acid and he knew exactly how many moles of hydrogen and chlorine ions there were. And again, very carefully measured quantity of uh, sodium hydroxide. And uh, either of those, if you were to drink them, you would be dead. The hydrochloric acid would, um, would corrode you and you would die. The um, sodium hydroxide will dissolve your tissues and you will die. Both of those would have been suicide beverages, but he mixed them together and there was a lot of foam and it was kind of cool to look at. And then when it was all done, we had salt water and he drank it. Um, and, and it was kind of weird to see him do that. We're like, oh wow, that's cool. Um, but he wound up with neutral water plus salt. So it just tasted bad and he peed a lot when he was done. Um, but the, uh, I'm not going to drink salt water because that's gross. But uh, anyway, th that's the kind of stuff we're talking about here. Low pH plus high pH, they neutralize each other and you wind up with neutral solution. <laughs> okay, so that is the crux of what we're doing. I'll give you a moment to write this. Okay, so when you mix a strong acid and a strong base, they react and you get salt water. Not always sodium chloride, that's what you get in, in the example I gave you from what my college prof did with the sodium, uh, the sodium coming from the sodium hydroxide and the chlorine coming from the hydrochloric acid. You don't always get sodium chloride salt water, but you get some kind of salt mixed with some kind of water. Um, the salt is formed by the cation of the base and the anion of the acid. So the cation of the base, the, the positive part, of the base. So in that example, sodium hydroxides, the sodium is the positive part of that ionic solution or that ionic, uh, yeah, solution. And the anion of the acid, hydrochloric acid and chlorine is the negative part. And so the negative part of the acid gets together with the positive part of the base and they form a salt. And so that is the salt part. And then the the hydroxide part of the base, the OH, gets together with the hydrogen part of the acid, HOH, and you have water. So you wind up having uh, something fairly harmless, salt water of some kind. Okay? Um, we usually have a metal in an acid. Acids usually have some kind of metal in them. I'm sorry, not true. The bases usually have some kind of metal in them. And the acids have some kind of non-metal, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, phosphonic acid, those sorts of things. It has some kind of anion that is a non-metal. And the bases usually have a metal as the cation. Okay? So the metal and the non-metal get together and form a salt. Water is formed by the reaction of the hydrogen from the acid and the hydroxide from the base. Okay? So I believe I show you a example of the reaction here. Yes, I do. Sodium hydroxide plus hydrochloric acid gives you salt water, salt and water. Okay, the reaction between the potassium hydroxide and sulfuric acid is the same thing. Potassium hydroxide, the potassium is going to form the uh, metal part of a salt, and then the sulfuric acid uh, is going to form, this, the, sulfur, the sulfate is going to form the negative part of the salt. And then here you have hydrogens and hydroxide. So you wind up, the hydrogens and the hydroxides get together to form water. And you wind up with potassium sulfate, which is a salt. Okay? So here again is salt water, not table salt and water, but another kind of salt and water. Um, another one, calcium hydroxide as the base, and nitric acid. So again, the nitrite is going to form um, sorry, the nitrate is going to be the negative part of a salt, and the calcium is going to be the positive part of the salt. 
And you, again, you have hydroxides and hydrogen. So hydroxides and hydrogen make water. And now you have calcium nitrate, uh, which is a salt. So salt water, salt water, salt water. When you mix acids and bases, you get salt water. You gotta make sure if you're gonna to try to get only salt water that you have a very carefully measured amount of acid and a very carefully measured amount of base so that they react completely and they go to completion and you don't have any base or acid left over. Would have been a real big bummer if my uh, chem prof from college had mismeasured the acid and the base and he had still a bunch of base left over after the reaction then it still would have dissolved his tissues and he still would have been not in a good place. So if you're going to do these kinds of reactions, um, you need to make sure that you're putting the same number of moles of acid and the same number of moles of base together to react fully. Uh, but acids and bases always make salt water. Okay? Um, titration. I'll give you a moment to write this down. A titration is a particular kind of neutralization reaction. Uh, in a titration, I've been given a jar of something, and I don't know the concentration of it. Um, and so this is useful in chemistry if you don't know, uh, you don't know the pH of something, and you need to know the pH of it. You need to know the concentration of hydrogen ions or the concentration of hydroxide ions in this acid or base that you've been given. And a uh, litmus paper or a universal indicator will only give you an approximate value. If you need to be exact, you need to know exactly the concentration of this, you need to know exactly the pH of this thing, then what we do is we take a, uh, if you have an unknown acid, I don't know the pH of this acid, but it's sulfuric acid of some concentration, then you, you take a known concentration base and you react them together very carefully and very slowly until you have a neutral pH. And then you can calculate how concentrated the unknown acid was because you know how many moles of the unknown base it took to neutralize them. Or the other way around, if you have an unknown base, this is you know, uh, calcium hydroxide, and I don't know the concentration of calcium hydroxide, I just know it is cal calcium hydroxide, I need to know exactly how concentrated it is for some other reaction you're going to do. I take a small sample of that and a known concentration of an acid, and I react them together carefully and slowly until they neutralize. Then I can know how many moles of acid went in, and I can calculate how many moles of base there were, and I can tell you the concentration. Okay, so this is this is like uh, forensic stoichiometry, is what this is. You don't know the answer to something, and you're going to carefully react until you do know the answer. Okay? You're trying to get to pH 7, and you'll do these reactions with, in the presence of a universal indicator, and the reaction goes slowly until the indicator changes color to 7. And then you go, okay, I'm done. This is neutral. And then at neutral, you can do all of your math, right? Because at that point, there's as many hydrogen ions as hydroxide ions. The reaction has reached equilibrium, and you can do your stoichiometry afterwards. Okay, so let's show an example. Here is a very intrigued chemist. Okay, um, she knows she has a solution of sodium hydroxide, so it's basic, but she doesn't know the concentration, <laughs> and she needs to know the pH exactly because there's going to be some kind of reaction she has to do, and she's got to know the pH of this, this chemical. So she takes a sample of it, and we're going to do some titration, okay? And you'll be doing this in a lab on Friday. She decides to titrate the sodium hydroxide with one molar hydrochloric acid in the presence of a pH indicator. So she takes some of the unknown NaOH, puts it in a beaker, and now she's going to very slowly add 1.0 molar hydrochloric acid and a pH indicator. She's going to watch the color change. She adds phenolphthalein solution, which is pink in the presence of a base and clear in the presence of a neutral or acidic solution. So the phenolphthalein is going to be pink because it's a base, but we don't know how basic it is. And we're going to be watching for that phenolphthalein to go clear because phenolphthalein is clear in a neutral solution or in an acidic solution. So we're going to keep adding acid very slowly until 
the phenyl thiamine goes clear. And then we're going to say, okay, then we've reached neutral solution. Okay. Um, then she adds one mole of hydrochloric acid in small volumes until the color starts to fade. Then adding one molar hydrochloric acid, one drop at a time, she finds the point where the NaO, NaOH has been completely neutralized and the solution is neutral. Okay, and so now here's a picture of a titration. We in our school sadly don't yet have these uh, burettes and, uh, and little tiny uh, droppers. Uh, we, we don't have that. You'll be using like eyedroppers for it, but um, the same principle applies. We start with a pink solution of base. We don't know the pH. It's just base. And then we slowly add acid, one drop at a time. And when the color starts to fade, we, we go very slow as, as, so we can measure as accurately as possible the amount of hydrochloric acid that went in. And when it's clear, we stop. And we can measure the hydrochloric acid. We know how much went in to neutralize the solution. Okay. Now, as you can calculate how many moles of hydrochloric acid it took to neutralize the NaOH and know exactly what the molarity of the original solution was. So the math looks like this. If 300 mils of the unknown NaOH was neutralized by 225 mils of exactly one molar HCl, what's the concentration of the original solution? So um, we need to be in liters. So 225 mils is 0.225 liters. 0.225 liters times one molar, which is one mole per liter, means that she added 0.225 moles of hydrochloric acid. Okay? So it took 0.225 moles to neutralize, so there must have been 0.225 moles of AOH because 0.225 moles of hydrogen was able to react with 0.225 moles of hydroxide to form water to neutralize. So then she had 0.225 moles of sodium hydroxide in 300 milliliters of solution. <coughs> cover up our intrigued chemist. There you go. 300 mils of original solution is 0.3 liters. She had 0.225 moles of it in 0.3 liters. You do the division and she had a 0.75 molar solution. Okay, so that's how you do this kind of math. It's not hard math. You have to be able to get molarity. Um, I'm sorry, knowing molarity, you have to get the number of moles of acid or base that you added. It'll be the same number of moles that was present in the unknown. Use the volume of the unknown and get the molarity of the unknown solution. Okay, this is Friday's lab. This is what we're doing together on. Okay, and you could then calculate PO, POH or pH if you wanted to because you knew the molarity. So you could express that as concentration of hydroxide or concentration of hydrogen and get the pH. Okay, you guys understand the idea? Add slowly, watch the reaction, stop when it's done, do a little math. So I'm going to show you. This, uh, this working here. Okay, so the next part of the, the last part of the chapter talks about buffers, and I could just have Celeste and Hannah come up and talk about buffers because that's their science they're brushing as well. Right? No? Oh, come on. Okay. So buffers are solutions that resist pH change. So when an acid or a base is added to a solution, it changes the pH. That's why acids and bases are used in chemistry, is to affect pH. But sometimes you want to be able to add solutions to a, an environment without changing the pH. You want that environment to get the acid in there or the base in there for some other reason. But you don't want the pH to change. And so in that case, you use these things called buffers. A buffer is a chemical that can absorb the hydrogen or the hydroxide ions from the acid or the base without letting the pH change. It doesn't ionize the water. It doesn't make more uh, hydrogen or hydroxide ions, so the pH doesn't change. They're very, very useful in lots of chemical labs. A lot of industrial chemistry has to happen at a very carefully controlled pH. So if you're making a compound, if you're making a drug, if you're making a, a product, 
you need to control the pH. You need the pH to be at a particular um, level, and the, the presence of a buffer will help you do that. This is also very useful in biology. Your body operates at a particular pH. Uh, the human body's pH is about 8.4. You're a little bit basic. Uh, and so if you get foods that are acidic, if you like spicy food and you eat salsa or chili peppers or things of that nature, those are acidic. If you drink a lot of citrus juice, orange juice, lemon juice in your water, if you start your day with apple cider vinegar, those are acidic. And so you're putting acidic foods in your body, but your body needs to stay slightly basic in order for all the chemistry in you to work. And so there are compounds in your blood that will absorb the acidity of some of your foods and will allow your body to stay slightly basic, okay? Um, and that is a buffer that will do that. Um, the, uh, the science fair project that Hannah and Celeste did was about the acidity of the oceans, and everybody's freaking out about the acidification of the oceans and how the oceans are getting more acidic, and they are getting more acidic. But the, uh, the acid that is created in the pollution of our oceans, and the reason the ocean is getting more acidic is it's creating more carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a buffer. It's an acid, but it's a very weak acid, and it absorbs the ions of stronger acids and keeps the pH fairly close to neutral. It's acidic, but it's not as acidic as it could be. So if you had, if you had pure water and you poured in sulfuric acid, the pH would go way down. If you have carbonic acid and you pour in sulfuric acid, the pH doesn't change much. So carbonic acid is an acid, but it's a weak acid and it's a buffer and it keeps the pH fairly high as far as acids go. And so their project was about, was about how God has designed the acidification of the ocean to create a buffering acid, not a, a runaway acid that keeps the, uh, that, that uh, is, is evidence of God's design and creation. I thought it was a great project. Um, and uh, I'm sorry it didn't go on to stake, but I, I, I think you guys did a great job. There was, interestingly, a very similar project uh, at state that looked at what, um, what are the best buffers to ocean acidification. And this person kind of unrealistically in their, in their discussion was like, what could we add to the ocean to change its pH? Like we're going to drive around in huge boats and pour, I don't, I don't know how you add it to the ocean. It's a lot of water out there. But they're in their little experiment, they found that the very best thing you could add to ocean water to control the pH and to buffer the ocean acidification was calcium carbonate, which is what then would go into the water and make carbonic acid, which would buffer the solution. So it's exactly the same kind of pathway that you guys were thinking of. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's cool. And God uses buffers in his creation. God uses buffers in the ocean. God uses buffers in cells. God uses buffers in all kinds of things to control the pH. Um, a lot of times medication is a, is a buffer. If you have heartburn and you chew up some Tums, uh, you're adding a buffer to your stomach. And that's going to set the pH of your stomach to a level that will not cause you pain. Okay? So buffers are very cool and part of God's design in the world. And that is the end of it. Any questions?